Hi, thanks for joining us today. I'm Dr. Andrea Nerlish, and I'm the Program Director of the Rehabilitation Counseling Program. And I'm hoping that if you're joining us today, you're interested in learning a little bit about rehabilitation counseling, um, just as a profession, because I'm really gonna take a different approach with this webinar. Um, most of the time when I do webinars, it's really directly marketing for our program, but in a way I'm gonna be doing that. But mostly I wanna educate you about the profession of rehab counseling. Um, we find that sometimes people come to us by way of starting another program and then realizing what rehab counseling is and that it better fits them, or individuals have pursued a different degree and then come to rehabilitation counseling by way of an advanced certificate to add our skill set and knowledge base um, to their professional counseling degree. So let's look at what rehab counseling is and isn't, and then really decide if this is the right field for you. So I've been learning about practicing and teaching rehab counseling for nearly 25 years. And when, you, when I go out and I meet people, um, you know, you go out to a new party or you're at a cocktail party or something like that, people inevitably ask you what you do. And obviously I answer this as I'm a rehab counselor. And here is examples of some of the responses that I get. So is it like social work? Well, sort of, but there's a lot more to the field of rehab counseling. Um, so it's like physical therapy, right? Well, it's actually closer probably to occupational therapy in terms of our focus, but it's not an allied health profession. We're not doing any kind of physical modalities with people. Um, yeah, I think I need that. We could all drink a little less, okay? People usually confuse rehab counselor with substance use counseling. And although people who have substance use disorders are individuals that we work with, this is only one population that we work with. And we have um, a broad array of individuals that we work with. But I want to be a mental health counselor. Well, that's great. We work with people with psychiatric disabilities too. But we can also help them with other adjustment issues, helping them get into work, um, other needs that help improve their quality of life in addition to the counseling that we provide. But, you know, by the way, actually about 75% of the students that graduate from our program also graduate um, M, uh, LMHC eligible. So we can talk about that in a little bit. And then lastly, oh, that must be so rewarding. It's such a good thing that you do. Well, it is, but rehab counseling isn't about charity and we don't pity the people that we're working with. We are just working with them to facilitate, to improve their lives. And you'll see kind of how we do that as over the course of this webinar, okay? So rehab counseling is kind of like some of these comments, but it's much more holistic and dynamic. So what is rehab counseling? <clears throat> Here I have some of the definitions of rehab counseling, but I've highlighted some of the, <clears throat> excuse me, key concepts and functions that really drive us. So as you can see, some of the highlighted words here, you know, we really do work with a broad population. So physical, mental, developmental, cognitive, and emotional disabilities. And we're working with them to achieve a broad range of goals, very diverse goals. Some of them are going to be personal, work-related, or just independent living, how they integrate um, into society and how we can help them integrate into these settings and be part of the communities that they choose. The, and we do all this through a counseling process, okay? But it's not the typical counseling that you probably think of that someone comes in for a 50-hour session and you just talk back and forth. Um, our counseling really has, you know, a lot of interventions that are activity-oriented. Um, we're looking to decrease the negative impact of disability for the person. We're helping to get a person to integrate that disability into their own identity so that they can make meaning out of that experience and help contribute more to society, help them advocate for themselves, engage more socially, uh, manage their condition more effectively, and really find a quality of life that satisfies them. So it's, you know, you're probably thinking that, all right, well, you know, that that's very broad and um, how do we make that more specific? And we do that through our knowledge base and, and our skills. And you can really figure out a way to apply this degree and apply this counseling specialty how you see it. Another definition here, looking at the idea of helping a person adapt and then assisting environments to accommodate. 
And that really comes from the model that we work from, um, the biopsychosocial model, or sometimes what's called the sociopolitical model. The idea that there's something that, you know, there's two parts to this, that there's something about the person that may need to change, and there's something about the environment and society that may need to change. And by helping those two things to happen, a person is better able to fully participate in society. One of these venues is work, but really we're looking at socially, in the home, in school, in their community. Um, so it's a little bit of a give and take that the person has to change perhaps some way and learn some skills um, and that environments can change. And what's great is that, you know, we're looking to help all individuals with disabilities. There are some other counseling specialties that work with some populations of disability like substance use or mental health, but we work with a broad range of people with disabilities. And we've actually been doing that for a very long time. Um, so here's a little bit of an abridged version of our history. You know, we really have, this really does date back to legislation that happened in 1918 as well as 1920, um, both for veterans that were coming back from World War I, as well as then in 1920, um, rehabilitation acts that provided services to assist people with disabilities and civilians with disabilities. At the time, this really was people with just physical disabilities, but over time we've added to include all people with disabilities in our professional scope of practice. In, the 19, in 1954, the amendments to this legislation um, really realized that, okay, now we're serving people with disabilities, but how do we make sure that the people who are doing this kind of work are well-trained, that they share some commonalities in their preparation, in their knowledge base. So at this time, the legislation created the master's programs, like the one that we have here at Hofstra University. It also created an avenue for the Rehab Services Administration, or what is now called the Rehab Services Administration. We have federal grants that help um, assist tuition for people who are training in master's level programs and rehab counseling in those programs that vie for those grants. Also, at, in 1954, the legislation expanded to increase, um, increase the populations that we work with, and that included mental health populations. So even though there are specialties like mental health counseling that work with people with psychiatric disabilities, Rehab counselors have, have been doing that for over 60 years. In the 50s, we also had professional organizations. This is great because this is a key part to a professionalization movement, um, really having organizations to help provide continuing education as well as disseminating research to practitioners in the field so that they stay current. In the 70s, this was a big push in our professionalization because at the time, CORE, which um, is the Commission on Rehab Education, standardized educational criteria so that everyone, if you graduated from a rehab counseling program, it wasn't necessarily delivered in the same way, but you had the same knowledge base. Um, so if you came out as a rehab counselor, it was understood what you would be able to know and be able to do. Also, our credential, CRCC, which is the Commission on Rehab Counselor Certification, which is one of the oldest international certification bodies, um, was established and they maintain the CRC exam. So that's offered three times a year. And they also help maintain your credentials. So once you become a credentialed rehab counselor, you have five years in order to accrue 100 hours of continuing education. So even after you graduate, you really need to maintain your skills and stay up to date with how the field changes as you get out there, because you can't assume that you know, uh, 30, 40 years into a career that, you know, things haven't changed, that you don't have to keep up with that. The other thing that CRCC does is make sure that they continually update the exam so it's reflecting um, current knowledge and current practice and evidence-based practice in the field. Now, most recently in 2016, CORE merged with KCREP. So now we are one of, considered one of the counseling specialties within KCREP. And there's actually two rehabilitation counseling specialties. Rehabilitation counseling, which is more of the traditional fo broad focus of rehab counseling. And then they have termed what is called clinical rehabilitation counseling. So that's broad based rehab counseling with also a more specific emphasis on psychiatric populations. OK, so this all sounds good, right? So you might have another question. 
And that's why haven't I heard about rehab counseling? Okay. Well, you have. The thing is, though, is that we've kind of been hiding in plain sight. Okay. It's just that the job titles that typically rehab counselors hold aren't always going to be certified rehab counselor or it's not going to be rehab counselor. Commonly, you might see job titles that have vocational or employment, disability or career in the title, given that we use work um, and preparing for work as a therapeutic modality. We don't just see work you know, as a goal. Um, we know that working is just so much more than that for people. It sustains them. It gives them purpose and identity. Um, it expands social resources and capital. And in many cases, you know, especially if a person acquires a disability, it allows them to recapture part of their life and part of their former self that they had before that disability. So much like I get the question, you know, oh, at a party, what is it that you do for a living? This idea of professional identity or career identity or work being part of our identity is so critical. So we can see how that's similar for people with disabilities. So rehab counselors aren't just about job placement. You know, we use it as one of our therapeutic techniques. Um, and that really is what makes us unique. But let's first look at some commonalities among professions that people consider sometimes alongside considering rehab counseling uh, as their professional goal. So what do we share in common? If you look here, typically when people come to me, they're also considering potentially mental health counseling or maybe social work, or more so they're figuring out between mental health counseling and social work, and then they come to me and say, oh, what's this thing rehab counseling? But um, again, that's why this is titled one of, no longer one of the best kept secrets. But we can see that there's commonalities among you know, rehab counseling and mental health counseling, which are counseling specialties, and social work, which is a human service specialty. They're, by and large, um, the similarities among these programs are what make the choice among them difficult. But they are all helping professions. So at the core of it, you're working with individuals. And in order to work with those individuals, you have specific training. You're going to be credentialed in a certain way, that there's going to be an oversight body that's accrediting you and making sure that you're held to a high standard in terms of your performance, your competence, and your skills. And that even while you're learning and when you graduate, that the service that you're providing um, is within a scope of ethics and that you're providing very um, providing services with integrity. Okay. All of the individuals that we work with, um, clients or even in the field of rehab, sometimes we use the word consumers, we're working with these individuals to help them overcome or lessen some of the personal concerns that they have. Okay, Obviously, how we do this in among these professions might be different, but we really all at the heart of it have the same goal. We're going to be looking to help provide services, make linkages for the person to know, and because we know, that it's not just, um, we can't do everything, okay? We have, we have a scope of practice and there may be needs out there that a person has in addition to what we can provide them. So we help to make those linkages and help consult with others to expand our services for the person to give them the most effective services that we can. And then lastly, we work with individuals who present with emotional and personal adjustment concerns. Obviously in our case as rehab counselors, these people also have disabilities, okay? And much of the adjustment may be surrounding how does a person adjust to and integrate disability um, into their daily life, okay? But there are differences that make each of these professions unique, okay? So this is where you can see the distinction about what might be the right path for you. With, in terms of scope of practice and the unique services that are provided among rehab counseling, mental health counseling, and social work. Um, mental health counseling and rehab counseling are going to focus more on counseling as a primary function, whereas social work tends to be more um, looking at coordination of services and linking a person with systems um, in order to get assistance. Now, again, the credentialing within social work might be different um, because if a person then goes on to get spe more specialized training to become an LCSW, they may in fact, do more therapeutic work. Um, but generalist training in social work really is looking at more of a systems type of service provision. And that's where we see models 
um, impacting the type of work that we do. Okay. And this is where there's a big difference in terms of the focus. Now, social work is going to operate from a systems model. They might be looking to change systems, um, looking to link people with systems. So it might have a little bit less of a focus on the individual and more how the systems around the individual are going to help them. Okay, and how can we improve those systems to help more people that that is being worked with a social worker for mental health counseling, there tends to be a little bit more of a medical model to it. Um, the idea that there is some sort of pathology that a person has and from that diagnosis, we're going to choose interventions to work with the person on. That's not to say that there isn't any consideration give given to the social forces within a person, but it does tend, uh, or the social forces impacting a person, but it does tend to be more of an individualized kind of focus and, and really based on lessening symptoms and having that person kind of manage their life. Now with rehab counseling, we're kind of somewhere in between that because we take a very broad perspective in the models that we use. Um, formerly rehab did operate from a medical model, but as we've evolved over time, and especially as we've seen in the professionalization movement since the 50s, we've gone more to a biopsychosocial model. So we're recognizing that there is biological factors. Yes, a person has a diagnosis and a disability and functional limitations based on that disability. We recognize that, but it's not the end all be all. And we're not necessarily looking to quote unquote, cure a person of their disability. The idea is to look at how a person manages that disability. Um, the psychological part, the psycho part is again, how is the person adjusting? What are the behaviors and the emotions and the cognitions that come with that experience? And that there's going to be some sort of interaction and that's where the social comes in. And so again, that bi-directional force that I was talking about, that the person has to make some change and society has to make some change. And so you put all three of those things together in a holistic model, that's where we're operating from, that it's, that it's kind of more of a 360 approach, that it's not just the person, it's not just society, um, it's not just the disability. Yes, they have a diagnosis, but it doesn't necessarily define them, okay? Because you could work with 10 people with the same diagnosis and all of those people are going to have a different lived experience of that disability. As far as orientation, um, social workers and rehab counselors probably are a little more similar in that they take a very broad approach to what they're doing, whereas mental health counseling is going to be more focused on the counseling with that specific population of mental health, um, along with a little bit of service coordination for them. With populations, again, um, social work and rehab counseling is going to be a little bit um, broader. You know, obviously, rehab counselors work with all people with disabilities. Social workers tend to work with all at risk populations, but most of what makes a person at risk is going to come from a social factor like poverty or homelessness, um, being involved in foster care, being involved in the criminal justice system. So there, there's much more of a broad array of individuals that they're working with, whereas mental health counseling is obviously going to specialize with working with um, mental health populations and uh, substance use populations as well. When it comes to transferability of skills, again, you're going to see mental health counseling is going to be specialists in working with individuals um, with mental health and substance use, and obviously they're going to, they could transfer their counseling skills to working with other populations. Social workers have broad general based skills to coordinate. And so again, they can apply this in many settings. So, you know, working in hospital settings or working in social service settings um, and helping people transition from one setting to the next, like foster care, you know, into the community. Um, again, working with individuals who are homeless and getting them into social service systems. And then rehab counseling is going to have a broad set of skills that can, again, be broadly applied to this, I guess you would say, specific population of people with disabilities. But we know that people with disabilities represent a very general category. And we'll look at that a little bit more specifically in a second. So let's look now more specifically at rehab counseling now that we can see the differences and similarities among some of our 
kind of sister fields that we work with. I'm sure you've probably heard before of KSA, knowledge, skills, and attitudes that relate to certain jobs. And when we think about rehab counseling, we actually kind of flip the KSA and the A comes first for us. That attitudes is really the base of what we do, okay? And attitudes is what we would term professional dispositions. And again, this is the foundational thing because you know we can teach you knowledge, we can teach you skills, but you kind of have to come in with this basis of character in order to be a good counselor. So the professional dispositions that we focus on in rehab counseling and in this program specifically are self-awareness, integrity, commitment, openness, and respect, okay? And these are really all grounded in the values that undergird rehab counseling, okay? And really, this is a growing list. Um, rehab counseling literature and, and a lot of our great researchers, this has been growing out since the 1980s by uh, one of kind of the founders of you know, rehab, modern day rehab counseling is Beatrice Wright. And the idea of everything that we do in counseling and everything that we do with the folks that we work with come from our values. And if we don't have these values intact and we don't believe in them deeply, then there's really no purpose to what it is that we're doing. Okay. So first and foremost, in the center of it is individualized and client centered. Okay. The one thing I can't stress enough is that rehab counseling is not cookie cutter. Um, like I said before, 10 people, same diagnosis, you're going to work with them in 10 different ways because of who they are and what else gets added into the equation in terms of their other types of diversity factors. So we see disability as one piece of that spectrum of diversity, but really, you know, they're going to come from a culture, be of a certain age, be of a gender, be of a sexual orientation or gender identity, you know. Um, have a religion, you know, come from a certain geography, and all of that needs to be taken into account. So we need to focus on the individual and use our broad base of understanding about some of those things, but more so, how do how does that person present? How do they present their culture or religion or gender? Okay, and from that basis, then we incorporate the other values. You know, I mentioned before the idea of holism that we take a 360 view of the person and you know, how can we work to impact change within that person, within their family, within their workplace, and then more broadly, how can we work to change society to be more inclusive? Dignity and rights are probably the first thing that's ever mentioned in our scope of practice, in, you know, all the research that comes out. People with disabilities in our society tend to be viewed as second-class citizens, and that is not how we feel as rehab counselors. The idea is that we fight and advocate to make sure that there is equal access and that there is equal inclusion and that there is equal respect, um, that the human rights that every person um, is afforded are afforded to people with disabilities. And this is based on a very strengths-based approach. If you look at a medical model, usually it's a deficit model where what functional limitations does the person have and how does that prevent them from participating? What does that keep them from doing? How we view rehab count in rehab counseling is, okay, yes, you have a disability, but what can you still do? What is it about you? Maybe there is a function that you can't perform with your body physically, but intellectually and cognitively and, and just who that person is, what can they still do and how can we use that in order to carve out you know, the best possible life for them. And this is through empowerment and advocacy, okay? Um, we are not about doing for, okay? We are about teaching a person to do for themselves to the greatest extent possible. You may be working with a person with a spinal cord injury that can't move anything but their eyes, okay? But that does not mean they still can't direct everything that goes on in their life, who they choose um, to help them, um, even in dressing and bathing and, and everything else, you know, the idea that they should feel empowered to be able to make choices for themselves. Um, and I always tell my students that through this empowerment and advocacy, we're trying to make ourselves obsolete. We are trying to get the person to be able to do things on their own. Um, and some of this comes from um, also fighting alongside individuals to make some changes in society, but more so teaching them how to do it for themselves. 
competence and integrity comes from the knowledge and skill base that we have, you know, but also the idea that when we work with others within an interdisciplinary team, that we hope that they have the same level of integrity that we're working with. And then as part of this um, interdisciplinary model, which is kind of prevalent in the field right now, collaboration and innovation, okay? That we are open to respecting the skills and uniqueness of other professions. How can we collaborate with them to better serve the individuals that we have, but also how do we keep learning, okay? And how do we embrace the ideal of lifelong learning so that you know, who we are when we graduate is still ever evolving 10, 15, 20, and 50 years into our profession as a rehab counselor and that we can stay current in the field and make sure that we're providing the best level of service. So then this kind of builds up to what our knowledge base is. These represent the core knowledge domains for the CRC exam and for rehab counseling curriculum, okay? Now, you can see that you're going to be expected to learn a lot. Okay, a lot of these, again, have things in common with other counseling specialties, um, you know, but you're also going to, you know, this is kind of your general training and you are likely going to take this general training and get into a practice setting or potentially work with a specific population or a specific function. Um, so you might specialize some of this. You may do some of this less than others, depending on where you go out in the field. But we make sure that every student has the same broad base of knowledge so that they can grow and adapt to how they want their rehab counseling practice to look. And then you're going to continue to go on and receive continuing education once you're in the field to update these skills or perhaps augment and increase certain skill areas as you find them pertinent to your practice as a rehab counselor. So I keep talking about practicing. Our scope of practice, again, as a rehab counselor, this is the service, these are the services that we provide. Now, again, is that to say that you provide all these services every day in every position that you're in? No, okay? But this is all that we are prepared and trained to perform. And you can see that there's overlap with some of the other professions, okay? Um, you know, but not only do we use traditional counseling, okay, we also use our knowledge to consult with other professions and other systems, to plan, okay, to make sure that the individuals that we're working with are integrated into, so into society in the ways that they prefer, okay. We also look to improve on what we're doing. So things like you know, engaging in resource and um, sorry, research and evaluating the programs that we use. We want to make sure that we're not just doing the same thing over and over again and expecting better results. So that's a big part of what we do to make sure that we have checks and balances in place, um, both from an individual perspective where we do treatment planning and assessment and appraisal to make sure that the service that we're providing to each individual client is effective. But when we look across all the services that we provide to people with disabilities, that as a whole, the programs that we're providing are um, very efficacious and that they're as efficient as possible. So now I keep mentioning this idea of all people with disabilities. Well, you know, what is that? You know, who do we work with? And that is all people with disabilities. Now, I think, again, when I talk about being a rehab counselor, everyone immediately goes to a certain subset of people with disabilities. And usually that's thinking about people with developmental disabilities, okay? Um, but you can see that there's a broad range of individuals that we work with. And this can be congenital disabilities, disabilities that a person is born with. These can be acquired disabilities that they, you know, sustain at some point throughout their life. These can be acute disabilities, something that happens in an instant, or it can be chronic disabilities that a person, you know, is um, living with their whole life and that may continue to change for them. The condition they have could be stable, you know, like, say, cerebral palsy. Um, can be episodic. It can come and go, like, say, uh, multiple sclerosis that has exacerbations and remissions. Or it could be progressive. It's just going to continue to get worse, like, say, with Alzheimer's, okay? Um, and even though there are specialty counseling professions and credentials for 
psychiatric and substance use disorders, we do that too. Okay. Um, so we may work with people with very visible types of disabilities, like an individual in a wheelchair or people with these quote unquote indiv invisible disabilities. They can be men um, medical conditions that a person has and they might not be known. Okay. So the people we work with are students, their seniors, um, veterans, moms and dads, um, injured first responders and, and other types of workers, or essentially you someday. You know, the truth of the matter is disability is probably the one inevitable experience for all people if you live long enough. You know, and we as rehab counselors are gonna be prepared to work with the roughly 13% of the population, or at least the civilian population, um, that's living with a disability at any point in time. Okay, so there's not going to be for a lack of people to work with. Um, and yes, all right, you know, the purpose of rehab counseling is so that people don't have to use us anymore. But the idea that there's always going to be people to work with and, you know, lives that, you know, that we can change through the work that we do. Okay, so where specifically do we do this? You know, our careers can be shaped how and where we want them to be. Um, our practice settings are very wide. You know, a, a large percentage of people do go into some sort of public agency, um, state vocational agency, um, working for the county, working for um, Health and Human Services. There are a number of community-based nonprofit types of agencies um, that, you know, work with smaller caseloads of people. Private for-profit companies like an insurance company, managed care organizations, um, working with injured workers. Our professionals work in high schools, sometimes, sometimes middle schools, but more so high schools, higher education settings, um, medical settings. Rehab counselors can work in private practice, centers for independent living who work with individuals with more significant disabilities, and veterans. Okay, so there is not going to be a lack of diversity um, for the agencies and service settings that you can work in. Now, you then may choose within those practice settings or the, or the types of practice settings you choose, you may work or feel comfortable or feel drawn to um, certain types of specializations. You can specialize by the population, okay? Much like mental health counselors specialize in psychiatric disability, you could choose to do that or working with people with traumatic brain injury or spinal cord injury. There may be a certain population that, you know, you feel that um, you want to use your entire skill set to serve one population. You could also specialize by function. And this is where you would serve a broad array of people um, and do one certain type of function of rehab counseling. I did this for a certain amount of time. Um, I'm also a certified vocational evaluator, so I provided assessment services to a wide range of individuals, okay? You could also do this in terms of, say, job placement. Um, you could also specialize by function in a special population if, if you choose. You may choose that you want to work with a certain age group as well. Um, one area of specialty for myself is transition age youth, working with folks in high school as well as college and how they make the transition either out of high school to college or out of high school to the world of work or maybe to adult services or the military. And what is that like for them and how do they get the skills and the preparation they need to make that next jump in their life? And then there's ever expanding opportunities for rehab counselors. And I'm amazed each and every day when I touch back with some of my alumni, the type of work that they're doing and the type of places that they find the applicability and the transferability of their rehab counseling skills. Um, obviously, some of these more innovative opportunities are going to require more training opportunities, um, you know, or more training and education on the part of the person going into it. But you know, specializing in transition or policy. You know, we have a former graduate who works at educational and testing services. You know, she analyzes every case for a person with a disability to make accommodations so that they can take their SATs or their GREs. You can do vocational expert work, you know, um, trying to determine, you know, a person who sustains a catastrophic injury, how should they be compensated for those years of life that they're not going to be able to work? Um, or people who are doing social security or would like to be on social security, how do you make those determinations? 
Um, how do you get people on benefits? You know, if you want to work in a college setting and be a disability services counselor, you know, and help provide accommodations and adjustment counseling um, and personal counseling for individuals who are in college settings. Okay. Even just working in business and industry, you know, rehab counselors are now being employed with large corporations as diversity and inclusion specialists. And how do you incorporate people with disabilities more effectively in the workplace and, you know, help with their socialization, help with their accommodations and really incorporate disability as a diversity factor among the other um, types of equal employment classifications that we have. Okay. So that's about all I can say about the profession that, you know, I've loved ever since I was a college freshman. But, you know, there are some places that you can go for more information about the profession in general. You know, I didn't list the sites here since it's not interactive, but you can go on the website for our um, certification body, CRCC. There's actually some great videos on there with testimonials from rehab counselors in the field. There's one called the Art of Rehab Counseling and there's one about the benefit of CRC certification. And what's the coolest thing about some of these videos is really just seeing, you know, as the vignettes are going by and as some of the rehab counselors are talking, look at their job titles. Look at the really diverse places that these individuals are working. Um, you know, some people were counselors like myself and then got into education. Some people are working in private settings, working with veterans. Um, it's really amazing the types of things that they're, that they're doing. You can look at the KCREP website. And if you are maybe thinking about, should I go into rehab counseling or clinical rehab counseling, you can look at the differences and the standards there and kind of look at what's going to be expected of you. ARCA and NRA National Rehab Association are two of the um, longstanding professional organizations for rehab counselors. Um, even within um, NRA, there's an organization, RCEA, Rehab Counselors and Educators Association, and they more specifically look at um, rehab counseling, whereas rehab NRA is just a little more of a, of a broad-based um, rehab organization. And then if you want more specific information on the outlook and some of the specifics of preparation and earning potential and things like that, you can you can go to the Bureau of Labor Statistics and it'll give you some updated information on the outlook for rehab counseling. OK, so now let's ask, you know, one more question. OK, so what is rehab counseling? Well, we are a very fast growing counseling specialty. Like I said, Bureau of Labor, Labor Statistics projected to have 13% growth over the next 10 years. So again, I we do not have problems with our graduates finding jobs. Um, and that's the good thing about it is a, even especially our students who are in the combined rehab counseling and mental health counseling, where they get both, they come out as a rehab counselor, they're pursuing mental health counseling licensure, they have a professional credential. So they're finding that that gets, gets them in the door um, even more quickly to the service pra and practice settings that they want. We are one of the highest paid counseling specialties. American Counseling Association looked across rehab counselors, mental health counselors, school counselors, and counselor educators. We were only bested by counselor educators um, who need advanced you know, um, doctoral level work. But rehab counselors earn higher salaries and have better benefits than other counseling specialties, even when accounting for geography, you know, because obviously the difference in a cost of living is going to be different from New York and Georgia and Alaska. But we see that that even held true, you know, across um, the geography of the United States. We are a federally supported training program. Um, we have. Um, federal traineeships established since 1954. And again, these are at training programs and master's programs that vie for these types of grants. Currently, we have two grants. We're going into our final year of two of the training grants that we have, and there's a new competition coming out. But luckily, you know, fingers crossed, we're very hopeful that we're going to get um, awarded the next round of grants. We've had these grants continuously for over 30 years. And what's great about these grants is that they provide tuition assistance, 75% um, of the money in the grant goes to tuition assistance for students. And this is like a loan that you don't have to pay back as long as 
you pay back in time after you graduate. For every one year you are funded, you pay back in time in a qualified setting for two years. As long as you report back your qualified um, professional experience and you serve as many years, you know, you did two and a half years in the program, you do five years of service out. As long as you do that, you are good in their eyes. Um, if for some reason you change professions, you don't go into the field, whatnot, it just gets paid back like a loan. Okay. So um, this is something that has really assisted a lot of our students. I myself benefited from it in both my master's and my doctoral program. So I can see the benefit of it. And it's, you know, really easy to work in the field in qualifying positions on once you graduate. Very dynamic. If you haven't figured it out from my presentation, we're a very dynamic and creative profession. Um, and the field, you know, the field as it is today is going to change in 10 years. So even everything I spoke about in terms of practice settings and innovative settings is going to change. Like I said, I'm continually amazed at how our students are using their degrees and their knowledge. So you can carve it out how you would like. OK. And what is helpful is that we are the only counseling specialty specialty with the knowledge base to serve all people with disabilities. And like I said, disability is probably the only inevitable in everyone's life if you live long enough. Okay. And what I can say about what rehab counseling is, it is the most amazing career you probably never heard of. Okay. But now you can't say that anymore. And I'm hoping that this gives you a little bit of food for thought for how you might want to pursue um, your graduate school. So the program here at Hofstra, um, we have two master's programs in rehabilitation counseling and we have two advanced certificates. OK, the both master's programs um, take roughly two and a half years. Um, currently, the master's in rehab counseling is a 51 credit program. By the year 2023, we will be going to a 60 credit program. But the general program, what we refer to as the general program in rehab counseling or the traditional program in rehab counseling, makes you CRC eligible. And that's the certified rehab counselor credential that is portable in all 50 states and Canada. Um, so the idea being you graduate with this, you can sit for your exam within your um, last semester or soon after graduation. As soon as you provide your transcript with a passing score on the test, you are a certified credential rehabilitation counseling counselor, and you can get up and move to another state, and you're a certified rehabilitation counselor. Okay, um, within both programs, there is didactic work, so classroom-based work, and then there is also field work experiences of a 100-hour practicum, counseling-based practicum in the field, and 600 hours of internship experience um, in an approved setting. Okay. Now, the MSED in Rehab Counseling and Mental Health, that's that clinical rehab counseling that I spoke about. So that makes you, again, CRC nationally CRC eligible, Okay, again, as long as you pass the exam. And it also makes you eligible to um, pursue licensed mental health counseling in the state of New York. Okay, That's not to say that it wouldn't make you eligible for other um, state licensures, but in the state of New York, we know that it's fully, you know, it's fully vetted and you are prepared for that. You would have to prove in other states and, and provide your transcripts and things like that um, in order to be licensed in other states. But with licensed mental health counseling, you graduate, you then have to find an approved setting, you have to do 3000 hours of postgraduate work, and you have to take an additional exam in order to be eligible for licensed mental health counseling. So that's where I say there's a difference and a benefit between the combined mental health counseling, um, rehab counseling and mental health over say a traditional mental health counseling because you will come out with a national certification and credential while you're working and while you're pursuing your licensed mental health counseling, okay? In other states outside of New York, as long as you do a 60 credit program, um, rehab counseling would actually um, prepare you for licensed professional counseling in other states. In fact, there are states that actually accept the CRC exam as the licensure exam. So, um, but with licensure, it is not fully portable. You have to, if you're licensed in one state, you have to get reciprocity in another state and apply in their state. Whereas CRC, you can keep bouncing between states and you still have that certification um, provided. And then lastly, our advanced certificates. If you are a person with a related counseling degree, you can take the necessary classes to make you eligible for the CRC credential. It may include also field work, um, working with people with disabilities. And then the advanced certificate 
in rehab counseling in mental health. Um, it's those who have a CRC credential, or sometimes we can look at other types of credentials, but can allow a person to pursue the licensed mental health counseling as an extension of their certification. Okay, and those both of those advanced certificates are highly tailored programs because they're going to be based on the um, educational requirements that you received in your previous master's degree. So if you want any more information about our programs, obviously you can contact me directly. Um, what I pride myself on as a program director is that I want to speak to you. I want to talk to you about your goals. I want to make sure that this is the program that's going to match you. It might not be, but you might not know that. And so I want you to talk to me and we can talk about what the options are, make sure that your goals um, your background, your preparation, um, and what you want to do are in line with a path in rehabilitation counseling. Okay. And I'm very honest and upfront about that. So if you want to contact me directly, we can have that conversation further as it relates to you more specifically. Okay. Um, with me, email tends to be best. Um, and we'll get the quickest response, but my office phone number is there as well. You can also click on the graduate, um, the, our webpage below and get a little bit more information. We have a couple of videos up there by my partner, Dr. Jamie Midas, and we also have a webinar up there about um, kind of the application process in some of the program components as well. Okay. So if you would like, if you have any questions right now, you can type them into the chat box. Um, I see there's a couple already, so I'll start with these, and if you have any more, um, please ask away. Uh, one question is, uh, when are classes offered? Um, most of our graduate programs in the graduate school at Hofstra really do cater to working adults. So all of our classes are in the evening. Typically rehab counseling and all kind of the counseling specialties offer classes Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, either at 4.30 or 6.30. They are two hour classes. Um, rehab classes tend to be more on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And, but what we do is work with you in terms of devising a plan of study that will help work with, you know, your work schedule as well as your life. Um, you know, like I said, most people are working adults with families and we acknowledge that. And we want to make sure that you can pursue your educational and vocational goals in line with, you know, what your family and life goals are as well. Um, in terms of the application process, you know, we are fully online in terms of our applications. I know our application system is actually changing um, very soon. So if you are inclined to apply um, very soon, you might want to also contact myself or graduate admissions because I know the system is changing over in July. But either way, we, we would make sure that we can get your application in. For the rehab counseling um, program, obviously you would need transcripts from any institution of higher education that you attended. We look for um, prerequisites, um, typically in psychology. We have four prerequisites of which you would have to have two, um, developmental psychology, personality, psychology, um, abnormal psychology, and statistics. However, Understanding that we are a disability field, um, we're more we're a little bit liberal about looking at other prerequisites that you might have had. Um, anything about looking um, classes you've had about disability or human services, we would also consider those in terms of your preparation. You need to have four references, um, professional references. We'd like one of those to be from um, a professor that's previously had you to speak to your academic potential. You have to have a current resume as well as a personal statement. And we like that personal statement to reflect, you know, what your career goals are, how you see this, you know, what attracts you to the field and how you see this degree really helping to enhance that professional goal or help you achieve that professional goal. Okay. Um, as far as accepting applications right now, I'm, I'm accepting applications for the fall. Uh, I've already, ex I've already started accepting students into this cohort. We do operate on a rolling admissions process. Um, and, you know, so that means you can apply at any time. You know, we have, you know, had people apply even in August and be able to accept them. I mean, but the quicker you get your um, application materials together, the better. Also, if you want to be eligible for those federal traineeships, um, the sooner you apply, 
you will become eligible for them because you have to be apply, you have to apply, be accepted, and be registered for classes before you can be considered for that funding. So if that's something that you're interested in, applying early is important. Um, we do accept people in both fall and spring. Um, most of our classes tend to be in the fall and the spring. We do have a handful of summer classes as an option as well. Um, you know, so, but obviously everyone's situation is different. And like I said, I like to get to know people um, and help walk them through that decision-making process, um, even as they're leading up to the application. So please feel free to reach out to me. Um, and if there are no other questions, I would like to thank you for taking the time and opportunity to speak with me today, or at least listen to me today. And I hope to see your name on an application soon. Thanks very much.